it started out that I was uh, conducted a quantitative survey of uh, Greater Winnipeg area residents with respect to their opinions and tolerances uh, regarding our urban deer population. And then I, coming out of that, that survey, it really uh, opened our eyes to the fact that in Winnipeg, we really didn't have an idea of what was going on within the urban center with respect to deer. So we started placing GPS collars on deer that resided within the city of Winnipeg and also deer that resided in Riding Mountain National Park. And that's a federal park that we have in Manitoba, about 300 kilometers to the northwest of uh, the city of Winnipeg. So we collared these two cohorts of animals to try and get a better understanding of how are they using urban space and how was it different or the same how they were using urban space to how they were using rural space. So here we're looking at their habitat use, their seasonal movement patterns and that kind of thing. From that, I wanted to obviously continue with that human dimensions component of my work. And so I, this really led me into doing some qualitative interviewing with Greater Winnipeg Area Residents. And there were some real uh, insights that came out of that interviewing. So I just wanted to start today uh, a bit. Uh, I've done so much uh, work on wildlife in urban areas that I, I wanted to start a bit and just sort of introduce why are we why are we having these conversations now? These are relatively new conversations. And urban wildlife management is certainly uh, relatively new in nature. We were really sort of urban or rural wildlife managers. And so what's going on? What's with the shift? And right now we currently have about 80% of Canadians that reside in urban space. And this is a real change that's happened over the last 50, 60, 70 years. We used to be primarily a rural agricultural society. And so as we start using the landscape differently and developing the landscape differently, this is going to have implications for a variety of wildlife species and implications for biodiversity overall. So I'm going to turn now and talk specifically about the species I'm going to talk about today, and that's white-tailed deer. How do white-tailed deer uh, thrive within these urban developed environments? And, and there's a number of reasons why they do so well. Um, white-tailed deer not only uh, have found a way to adapt to urban environments, but they actually thrive within them. And there's a few reasons for that. One, white-tailed deer are a generalist species. So they have the ability, they eat well over 600 different uh, known species of plants. Um, and now in many cities, uh, as I think Donna mentioned, they eat many other things other than plants, uh, lasagna and whatnot. Um, so urban centers provide them not only with um, natural uh, food sources, but also uh, human supplemented food sources. And so that what, what ends up happening is that helps uh, that animal with uh, body weight as they go into, in my city, winter. Um, so white-tailed deer are a non-native species to the city of Winnipeg and to Manitoba. They moved up with agriculture and with development. And so as they move into these areas, we would hope or think, uh, and why I say hope is because it helps manage the population from a natural perspective, but we would hope that weather overwintering would have an impact on the population and bring that population back into a check and balance. But what ends up happening is because there's so many human supplemented food sources and they are, are um, offered so many food sources within urban spaces, they end up going into that winter with, with a better body condition. So not only are they now surviving through uh, a winter season where perhaps maybe uh, without that human supplemented food source they may not but they're also likely to give birth to not only one um, possibly two and in some cases three uh, offspring every year so uh, that's the other reason uh, why we end up seeing a high abundance of white-tailed deer numbers very quickly is, is uh, over 90% of white-tailed deer will be bred in a year. They go into estrus twice. So if they haven't been bred in the first estrus, they will uh, likely be bred in the second estrus. And then if they are provided with uh, good food sources, they can have uh, twins and triplets. So we get this very, per, uh, very uh, uh, productive population uh, in addition to the fact that they have very little predators within an urban center. Um, we have a, a higher... Um, tolerance level, if you will, for the big brown uh, eyes of those white-tailed deer than we do with predators. There's a high level of perceived risk there. So when predators are identified, they're often quickly removed. Um, and so what ends up happening is, again, we've modified a natural check and balance system. Okay. Second to that, we've got firearm discharge laws within urban centers. And so deer are quite savvy and they recognize the fact that they have a lack of the human predator, if you will, and so they've got refuge within an urban environment. 
All I wanted to show here is, is uh, what we'd anticipate with a growing urban white-tailed deer population, the Greater Winnipeg area has experienced a growth in human-wildlife conflict. And this was everything from, uh, you know, the deer ate my plants um, to um, some more serious, which is the main one in the Greater Winnipeg area, and that's uh, um, deer vehicle collisions. And so this is a huge issue. Um, and so uh, while um, we may welcome uh, and um, enjoy having deer within our, our communities, this is a huge issue. Right now, um, the city of Winnipeg is trending just under 500 deer vehicle collisions per year. Um, we are spending, as a province, uh, over $30 million. This is second only to drunk driving. So this is a huge, huge issue. It's a huge issue financially. It's a huge issue for human safety. Um, and it's a huge issue from an animal welfare perspective. About 90% of the animals that are hit will die, um, but it will take uh, likely, depending on that, the collision, the, the potential is there. That's a big animal, so that the, the potential is there that, that that might take some time to happen. So from an animal welfare perspective, it's certainly not great. So looking back at that first quantitative survey that I conducted, uh, this dates back now to about 2008. All I wanted to show here, this, this represents from scientific, um, the, the way the methodology was laid out, that it's representative of the greater Winnipeg area population. And what came out of this is simply that at this time, when I surveyed the greater Winnipeg area population, 76% of the individuals in that city said they overall enjoy having deer within their community, despite that 43% of them said that they do worry about some of that conflict. Overall, 76% of them indicated that they do enjoy having deer. And when I started asking about some of the different management strategies that are available to us, and there's, there's a whole slew of them that are out there, non-lethal methods of management rank really high at that point in time. There was real opposition to lethal methods of management in the Greater Winnipeg area. And what comes out of that? And I asked this question in a variety of different ways, just to make sure that we were getting the answers out. Um, what happens here is we've got a whole lot of conflict, We've got an increasing population, and we've got a very serious issue with deer vehicle collisions. And now we've got a community saying we're not really on board with lethal methods of management. So what do we as wildlife managers do with that? And so certainly it challenged us to go out and to find out a little bit more about our urban deer population, get a little bit more information. It's very hard to manage something when you don't have a full picture of what's going on. And so we did conduct that uh, call ring program. And so animals, I won't go into the methodology here for time, but basically they were physically immobilized using clover box traps. Um, and collars were placed. Uh, I think I ended up handling close to 50 animals in the city of Winnipeg and uh, even more in Riding Mountain National Park. And so those animals are physically, immobil physically immobilized, the collar is placed on, and then they're released. What comes out of that is it allows us the opportunity to see where are these animals on the landscape. So these GPS collars that range about $3,500, the collar that I use, takes a satellite latitude and longitude location every two hours. It then sends me that information by cellular phone text message. So I get a very real-time uh, view of where these animals are. So technology has uh, advantages and disadvantages, um, but certainly uh, this is the technology in terms of animal tracking is... is um, improving uh, every day. And so what I've done here is I've taken those animals, looked at each individual, but also looked at the cohort, uh, urban cohort, in comparison to that rural cohort. And what came out of that very quickly is there are some very big differences. So animals that are residing within an urban space are behaving, acting, using habitat very differently than they would be in a larger, unfragmented block of habitat that's characterized by low human population density. So right away, I started to see these differences. And this is an image which shows you home range size. So you can see where the animal lives its life is a whole lot bigger in a natural environment than it is in an, in an urban environment. So it doesn't take long for us to ask the question, well, why? What's going on that these animals are residing in such close spaces? And so I take uh, just one example to show you today. This is a collared female. Um, it is uh, an animal that over this winter had a home range size of 1.7 kilometers squared, which is very, very small for a white-tailed deer. And I just wanted to show you, I'd, I'd take each animal and I'd, I'd kind of hone in on where that animal was and look at what that animal was doing. And, and that black uh, there is just showing you the core. So how many times I'm picking up on that location at that uh, geographic uh, position um, on the map and seeing what is at that location, what is driving that animal to that location. And you can see that uh, just a whole mess of lines, that's the animal's path. So that's the movement between one G, uh, GPS fix to another. Now that's representing a straight line. It's often, uh, obviously, likely not a straight line, but that's the best we can do with our technology. But what it's showing there is simply that that animal is going across that road 
That's a primary roadway. It's a four-lane roadway, and it's going across that road multiple times a day playing Russian roulette um, in its habitual pattern. Okay, so white-tailed deer in the city of Winnipeg, I can tell you from the ones that I call it, are very habitual. They've got a very uh, clear routine. And so we are now uh, dealing with a situation where we've got an animal crossing that roadway multiple times a day. So what is it? So what I did is I took uh, the information coming out of the animal off of that collar. I looked at the highest density of uh, square meter, honed in on what property that was, and I approached that uh, residential owner. Um, in all my cases, they were residential properties. So I honed in on that residential owner and asked them if they'd sit down and engage in a qualitative interview with me. I wanted to look at what was it that was drawing that animal to that location multiple times a day. And I don't think it's any shock uh, to any of us that uh, what was drawing them to that location multiple times a day was an artificial food source. In 100% of the cases, it was an artificial food source. And certainly we're talking about the city of Winnipeg. This is uh, big business, um, and by that I mean um, it comes from, um, I believe in all cases, uh, very good intentions, um, but these individuals are feeding upwards of 30 animals per day. And so you're getting a massive feeding operation that's happening, and this is in uh, the heart of residential space within the city of Winnipeg. So what ends up happening here is there's, with uh, coexistence comes responsibility. And so we, we have a responsibility. We, we answer the survey uh, with Winnipeg area residents saying they overall enjoy having deer within the community and they don't want to see these open methods of management. But at the same time, there's some social behavior that's playing a role here in dictating not only the occurrence, but the frequency of, of human wildlife conflict that's happening. And I also want to point out here that human wildlife conflict is very often related to human human conflict. So here I have a situation where I've got two neighbors that have lived side by side for 30 plus years. We've got one who is a feeder, the other who is adamantly opposed to it, who's a hunter. Uh, that relationship is now completely rift. Um, and because the city of Winnipeg is not yet at a point where we have gone in and started our management initiatives, we're in an information gathering pocket of time. Some of these residents are taking management into their own hands. So the hunter is now buying a bull mastiff he, that he now keeps off leash. She is feeding 30 animals a day. He releases the bull mastiff. 30 deer now scatter onto that roadway that has four lanes. Okay, so here we are in a situation where we can see that without um, gathering the information and going in and starting to manage this issue, which is a very serious issue, um, and I can go into, I, not, I won't for the sake of time, but all of the downfalls that come in terms of feeding um, white-tailed deer specifically, but wildlife more generally. Um, but even after reading these residents, part of my qualitative interview is really going through and saying, here's a map of this animal, here's what this animal is doing, here's the roadway. This, this animal has a higher likelihood of being hit by a car than it does dying uh, and not being fed a lower body weight going into winter. So we're, we're actually doing a misjustice read out all the downfalls, and these individuals were very, very passionate. I had a couple cry, um, but were very, very passionate about they can't stop. And that's important for us to understand, okay? So these, these people are coming from a kind place, um, they mean well, but there's something even more going on. And that was really what my work tried to do. I, I'm, I'm short on time, but in terms of methodology, really looking at wildlife value uh, orientations, really looking at emotion, and how does this connect to social behavior? And um, we need to understand that better. And this is a challenge because you're now asking a wildlife manager um, uh, who is trained with certain skills coming out of university to now engage in skills where they are uh, interviewing, uh, they're doing social sciences, uh, they're doing um, <laughs> the conflict resolution. Um, and these require a different set of tools in the toolkit than what they're coming out with in terms of their education. So it really needs now, a new uh, wildlife manager needs to be interdisciplinary in nature really needs to bridge those gaps. The solutions are going to be, um, they're going to have to go beyond lethal methods of management. Uh, and certainly I'll stand before you and say I'm not opposed to lethal methods of management. Um, I am um, uh, encourage multiple uh, pronged approach to trying to find solutions. So there are creative ways that we can try and look at how do we manage a population that's overabundant? How do we manage when we have 30 plus million dollars in deer vehicle collisions, human death, animal death, um, and uh, how do we move forward with that? And we're going to have to get a little bit deeper into understanding social behavior and the role that we all have in um, potentially creating um, more human wildlife conflict than needs to be. One of the things that came through really important out of that research is there was obviously, it, it didn't take much to connect the dots here in terms of having um, uh, um, connectivity between 
we have a feed site, we have high deer density, and we have high uh, deer vehicle collisions. And so there's a, 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 a now a positive correlation that's been put in place. And while to all of us that might seem very simple, it might have been like one plus one equals two, uh, it was important for us from a scientific perspective to link that through a methodology and, and, um, and, uh, and, a, and a scientific study so that we now can go forward to the powers that be and say we now have it before us and we have a responsibility to our community to move forward with management. So overall, uh, I think that we have a long way to go. Uh, certainly in my uh, jurisdiction, in the Greater Winnipeg area, as I mentioned, we are in an information gathering pocket of time, um, which is uh, in some ways uh, a really great way of saying um, politically this is sticky and I'm not sure how to handle it. Um, so we are, we're working on it. Um, and um, uh, I'm hoping that we're going to move in a direction where we'll start to put some management on the landscape because if we don't, what I believe is happening from my seven years of walking in these neighborhoods is, is people are taking management into their own hands and, and that is uh, where we, we not only have the existing challenges but we end up with a, a whole slew of more challenges. So lots of work yet to be done um, but it's certainly going to call on us uh, as managers, as biologists, as uh, um, as organization leaders um, to make sure that we're being inter interdisciplinary in nature. We really have to look at this problem uh, a little bit more broad in scope than, than we might have traditionally.